Hello and welcome to Journeys and Journals. We are on a different journey today. We're going to look at weather. It affects us all, but our expert today is going to give us a college class on what it's been like in our valley and throughout the state. Oregon, California. I'd like you to meet Leon Hunsinger. Welcome to our show. You are our expert witness. <laughs> well, very good. Thank you, Bernie. Nice the to be here. The show's yours. I'm going to sit back and learn. Hope so. <laughs> well, before we get into the presentation, uh, we are going to talk about the legendary floods of 1861 and 1862 today. I'm going to list the primary sources ahead of time so I don't have to keep referring to them during my discussion. Some of the primary sources uh, are the Oregon Weather Book, the author, the state climatologist, George H. Taylor with Raymond H. Hatton. Now, the great California floods of 1862, that was a report recently at a scientific meeting, national scientific meeting, and the uh, Authors are W. Leonard Taylor, M.D., and Robert W. Taylor has a Ph.D. in geophysics. Robert's retired, and Leonard still is working in the hospital. He's the chief pathologist at Redlands, Redlands Community Hospital. The Sacramento Bee, quite a bit of material from, from them, and they're a great series, Tempting Fate. And uh, just completed uh, on Northern California floods, my good friend, Dr. Claude Kern, Professor Emeritus at Southern Oregon State, Southern Oregon University, I should say. We researched the 1861-62 floods with emphasis on Northern California and how they affected mainly the Sacramento Valley. About 12 to 15 years ago, uh, commenting, uh, commemorating, I should say, the terrific flood of December 1964, an interview with me and I had something to say about 1861-62. The flood of 1964 tore through Southern Oregon and Northern California. Dams like Savage Rapids buried under the weight of Mother Nature. 30 years later, this wall still stands. The Rogue River is also tamed here at the Lost Creek Lake Dam, which was built in the mid 70s. Experts agree the Lost Creek Dam will stand under the pressure of a 1964 size flood but 100 years earlier, our region faced an even bigger, more devastating flood. If we ever had another series of events that occurred uh, like they did in 1861-62, wouldn't matter how many dams we had. Meteorologist Leon Hunsaker witnessed the flood of 64 and studied intensely the floods of 1862. He says in both cases, the cause of the river's rage was the same. A cold weather system out of the north mixed with a warm tropical storm system out of the south. And now is when the snow levels go from uh, three or four thousand feet right to the top of the mountain. And uh, this indicates the area of heavy rain uh, south of San Francisco all the way up well into the state of Washington and Oregon and Northern California is right in the middle of it. Although the cause of the floods is the same, he says the difference between 1964 and 1862 is that in 1862, there were a series of floods, one right after another. And if that type of system were to hit now, I don't think Lost Creek or any of the other dams, the Applegate, they're going to make that much difference. And I'm including uh, Shasta Lake, uh, I'm including Oroville, I'm including Folsom, because if you get a sequence of events like that, they're all going to be free-flowing rivers. Richard Cassidy is with the people who specialize in building those dams the Army Corps of Engineers. He says Hunsaker is right. Well, we start off here now. Uh, Dr. Kern and I, we went down in Northern California and we are research centers on pretty much the Yuba watershed. And we uh, took, chose the Yuba watershed because there's quite a bit of gold mining activity there. We got a lot of reports out of the mountains what the snow conditions were and everything else for these various storms. What was the snow like before the storm started? This is fairly well uh, in the center. Here's the Feather River on the north, the American River on the south, all the water coming in down past Sacramento. And uh, we actually made a stab at estimating the daily mean flows on the Yuba River at Smartville, which is just above Marysville. 
uh, the daily flows for the 1861-62 period. So uh, let's take, go on down the line here now. And uh, what was the anatomy of that particular storm, storm period? Well, right here in early December, this is daily rainfall at uh, Grass Valley. Look at those numbers, four and five inches a day. It really shot up there. But the interesting thing is when you examine the daily mean temperatures for the city of Sacramento, look how they shot up above uh, the mid-50s. And that means rain clear to the summit. So this was a heavy, warm storm. Then we find by looking down at uh, and here that there's about a 10 or 12 day period where not much goes on. Some rainfall over the Christmas holidays, temperatures running cooler, and it uh, looks like uh, they were getting snow at about uh, four or 5,000 feet and uh, above that. And below that, what snow there was is being washed off. Now, here we see a really cold spell, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Right there is a spike of over two inches, or over an inch, and then down in Sacramento it was over two inches. Heavy snow at low elevations, and then what do we get? In the first part of January, another spike in precipitation, and look at those temperatures, clear to the top. And another heavy, warm storm. Then it cools off again, and then once again the temperatures shoot up, and lo and behold, the, temp the precipitation goes up with it. So what do we have? We, if we take a look at the, uh, our estimates now of the stream flow, we have three major floods after the first week in December and before the last week in January. One, two, three were the flows, our estimate of 100,000 feet. This is the me mean daily stream flow estimate. And then there's the one over the Christmas holidays. Uh, what was it like volume-wise? We compared, made a 52-day comparison and uh, the six, 1964 December and February of 1986, January 1997, all of them in 52 days produced just under 2 million acre feet and that uh, at Smartville. Our estimate for 1861-62 says, hey, so, uh, 2.7 or 2.75 million acre feet, 25% greater. Now that really is significant because think of all that extra water and the pressure on the levees it really causes some uh, serious problems. Okay, uh, now we'll, uh, we'll go down and we'll look, let's look at the, uh, d around the Sacramento and the Sacramento Valley area right here. We want to focus in on this as the Delta region. And uh, this is where the uh, Sacramento River flows into the Delta. San Joaquin coming up from the south flows in and uh, this is a critical area. Professor Jeffrey Mount of uh, uh, Davis, their uh, watershed director, and uh, he's a geology professor there. He says there's over 1,100 miles of fragile levees in, the, in this region, in the Delta. 1,100 miles. Sorry. Now, uh, he also says, <laughs> kind of funny, he says that there are two kinds of levees in California, the kind that have failed and the kind that will fail. Oh my. And uh, he goes on to say, make a prediction. He says there's a two out of three chance that there'll be a major flood with the collapse of the levees in this region, two out of three chance in the next 50 years. Of course, he's including the possibility of an earthquake added to it in the East Bay Hills that would shake some of the levees down. Oh my. But this would be a major catastrophe of uh, Katrina proportions. There's no question about it. All the flooding that would occur in here of, of homes and so on. Besides that, uh, the drinking water supply for approximately 50% of the population of California would be affected because the water is transported out of the Delta down into Southern California. Now, uh, what? What went on, what were some of the things that happened in 1861-62? Uh, Map doesn't quite go high enough, but Red Bluff, from just south of Red Bluff all the way down through the Central Valley for 250 to 300 miles was a lake. Average oh. width, 20 miles wide. 
and all kinds of water pouring through and out into the Delta region and coming through the Carquinas and out into the San Pablo Bay and actually out through the Golden Gate. And uh, the, the flood was severe enough and the water was flowing uh, uh, enough agitation that it broke loose what they call tule pads. These tule pads were take, broke loose from some of the islands in the Delta. Some of them measured up to a half mile on a side, and they floated out through the Carquina Straits, through the North Bay, out through the Golden Gate, and with this northwest flow pattern on the ocean, it carried them right, a lot of them right down around to Monterey Bay. And uh, there were snakes in those pads, and those snakes, they didn't like riding in the ocean. They, they'd had enough of that, so they started bailing out, and then there was a lot of farmers down here that was all set with pitchforks to take care of them. So uh, back up to the Farallon Islands, a heavy laden ship, according to the captain, as it moved into the water, you know there wasn't any, any tide in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area for a week, the outflow was that strong. And the density of the water, of course, clear, uh, changed the buoyancy in the ship coming in, and it sank in lower, and the captain said they really had a problem. What was going on in Sacramento? Well, that one in December of 1861 uh, in Sacramento, they, uh, that flooded them early December. It also flooded uh, again, of course, over the Christmas holidays, the water came up, and then in January, a couple of major floods. And so people were getting around by boat. Mm. And uh, anyway, according to March, uh, in March, there were still sections of Sacramento where people were getting from one place to another by a boat. So it was a tremendous uh, situation. Now, so it was the greatest down in this part of the world. And it was also, uh, well, how about Central California? Well, I'd been told that December uh, 1867 was the worst down here instead of 1861-62. Then uh, I was down in Visalia doing some flood research work. And I uh, uh, asked the librarian what she knew about 1867. And she, she brought out a, uh, a, uh, a, a diary from a man who had camped out in Sequoia National Park during the middle of that storm in December of uh, 1867. And he was telling about being all practically shook out of bed uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, what, I guess he was in a sleeping bag, but his tent almost came down on him. Wall of water? Well, no, he was, the water was in the river right below him, the Kauia River, and it was roaring, he says. And then all of a sudden it went quiet. Huge landslide dammed off the river. And then it was quiet, he said, for about 12, 18 hours. And when that finally broke loose, that wall of water headed for the low country. And of course, that changed the course of some rivers, such a wall of water. And what I'd been told, the reason they said that 1867 was worse than 1861 and 62 was because it changed the course of rivers. And uh, they changed the uh, course of rivers. Well, yeah, it changed the course of rivers, all right, because of the landslides. Huh. But it was still the greatest in 1861, 62 produced the most water. But uh, I thought that was an interesting sidelight. What about Southern California? Well, Southern California, they, uh, the Taylor brothers researched this. Just recently, they presented a paper on it right here at a place called, just south of Colton, that's in the San Bernardino area. Tremendous runoff from in January of 1862 from storms into these mountains. And right at this point, a place called Agua Mansa, absolutely wiped out by the flood. And uh, it was just tremendous. All was left of the town was the steps of the church and the foundations for the columns. Of, uh, held some, some columns uh, at the church. Uh, San Bernardino uh, people actually uh, hired an engineer to come in and calculate what was the stream flow here. And he estimated it was over 300,000 cubic feet per second. 
Now, this gives me a chance to tie in what was going on up in Oregon. The Willamette Valley, the greatest flood, according to George Taylor, the climatologist, state climatologist, was 1861-62. And the flow on the Willamette at Portland was 635,000 cubic feet per second. These fellows down here on a usually placid uh, Santa Ana River, over 300,000. So it was half as great, half as great and twice as great as the flood in, eight, in December 1964 here in Rogue River, or not Rogue River, but in Grants Pass, on the Rogue River. The uh, uh, 1862 was 175,000, but it was twice as much as what occurred in December of 1964, which was 152,000. So uh, tremendous flood down in here, and this just wiped everything out. It, Filled the Orange County Valley uh, was full down here, and uh, the uh, water, according to reports, was up to four feet deep, four miles from the river, and lasted about four days down in there, like or four, uh, three or four weeks, I should say. And so uh, Disneyland would have been wiped out. Mm. And uh, there was a lot of flooding down around Los Angeles. And then a fellow by the name of Schimmelman, a senior scientist at the University of Indiana, he and uh, his partner, Megger, they, uh, based on some so sedimentary soil samples, that sedimentary samples that they took from the Santa Barbara watershed, they have concluded over the last 2,000 years that every 200 years, there's a historically huge flood in Southern California. And uh, while there's some kinks in it in their process, their procedure, they're trying to work them out, but they are now kind of the uh, feeling that there's a reasonable chance that a historically significant flood will occur in Southern California in the first 50 years of this century. Now, <laughs> now, what, wow. uh, what we, uh, now let's move back up to Northern California or Central at, but before I move this, this particular one off, remember this prediction. This man says there's a possibility of a historic, a flood of historic proportions in Southern California the first half of this century. Well, remember earlier we talked about a prediction of Jeffrey Mount, two and three chance that the uh, levees would collapse in the, uh, there'd be a ma major collapse in the levees in the Delta region in the next 50 years, well, Dr. Claude Kern and I are gonna make a prediction. And it involves the Folsom Dam. And uh, now, what's, we find out, we find out, believe it or not, that Folsom Dam, it's done a great job, it's done its work, but when they designed it, they didn't design the spillways large enough. And uh, so uh, what they're afraid of, you get a heavy storm down in there, so much water that you'll actually overtop the dam. And uh, that's scary mm -hmm. because down the Sacramento Flood Control District says that there's a, uh, about, oh, so something like 300,000 people and 150 or 60,000 structures that would be in the way of a major flood in Sacramento. So, uh, Here's how we arrived at our predictions. So let's build it up here now. Uh, the thing that we, uh, was kind of interesting about all this, that uh, Jeff McCracken of the uh, Bureau of Reclamation in an article about him in the Sacramento Union, he, or the Sacramento Bee rather, he, uh, he says that the, they said that the storm of February 1986 almost overtopped Folsom Dam. Another inch of precipitation on the American River watershed and it would have overtopped. So here we have then, uh, and it was a, this 1986 one was a, a two week storm. So we're comparing 15 day values from this flood with our estimate of 15 days, which takes in two major floods in the 15 days with this one. And this is how it turned out. Now we had uh, a, uh, the Corps of Engineers made some projections of the flow on the Yuba River at Marysville. And they were able to take out in their calculations all the effects of storage. So this would have been, as near as they can tell, what it would have been like at, uh, without storage. 
In 1986, 15-day period, the average flow per day was 43,000 cubic feet per second. Wow. That was 1986. Our projection, which takes in less of the water, less watershed, leaves out, it's up at Smartville, leaves out 150 square miles. That, we get 51,000. So volume-wise, uh, 1862 was the greatest. This is another thing, though, and this is where the real danger comes. Right, let's go to the temperatures here. Right here at the end of January, or end of December, rather, as we go into January 1862, see how the temperatures drop? It got cold. Uh, it got down to 17 degrees in Nevada City. It got uh, half, ice half inch thick, frozen Napa. And uh, the Taylor people who wrote that uh, one report on the great floods of 1862, they have a comment in there that about January 2nd or 3rd of 1862, it dropped temperature in, sec in San Francisco, dropped to 23 degrees. Ooh. So the ground was frozen. So then along comes another storm. There's that spike right there. It was much as two inches in Sacramento. And we put in frozen ground and put heavy snow on top of it. 12 to 15 inches of snow fell uh, on top of that frozen ground. And that was followed by a heavy, warm storm. Well, uh, let's look at this now and uh, get on to the... Uh, this is a snow line the snow profile on the Yuba watershed. And we, this has made all these little writings in here, references to news articles where we got the depths of the snow. And so just prior to the warm storm, this was the snow profile. But prior to that heavy snow, up to about 4,500 feet, there wasn't any snow on the watershed. And that's why the watershed froze. The snow wasn't protecting it. So then here comes the snow. Uh, 12 to 15 inches deep in Nevada City and Grass Valley, and it uh, snowed uh, almost three feet up at around 4,500 feet in Moore's Flat, uh, uh, and Eureka, and places like that. That's not Eureka over on the coast. That's Eureka, a, mines, a, a mining town in the mountains. All right, so what happens then when you get this heavy rain coming down on the snow? Snow does two things. Not only do you get melt, it also retards the runoff. It so starts to, it runoff that would have gone earlier in the storm is held up by the snow. Kind of like and, a sponge? It's like a sponge. And then finally that lets loose. And with it still storming very heavily, you get a wall of water headed down the uh, mountains. Was, was there indication that it was heavy? You betcha. Look at that profile. This is the actual hydrograph on the Sacramento River at Sacramento by Dr. Logan in 1862. This is the December upshoot. This is over the holidays. And then look at that, straight up. And you say, it's, well, it's only three feet. But look at, remember, the whole countryside was lay hundreds of square miles. The water level was raised two or three feet. So it was a massive amount of water came off of there. And that certainly would have been enough to overtop Folsom Dam. Okay, uh, Bernie, one more thing. How often does this type of a flood occur? Uh -huh. According to uh, the flood's effect on redwood trees in the north coast region of California, we, uh, using that as a guide, we estimate that this flood return period is about once every 200 to 225 years. Whew. It's been 140 years since the last one, so time is getting short for, uh, uh, from a probability standpoint that we'll get another one. So that, uh, that pretty well uh, wraps it up, uh, Bernie. That's our prediction and that's our presentation. What happens to those dams in the Sacramento? <laughs> You're scaring well, me. The, the, the dam at Folsom needs work. It's the head, it heads the list on the Bureau of Reclamation's list to be uh, upgraded. And, uh, but it does, it does need to be done. Well, Leon, I look at this picture. This is downtown where? Sacramento. I mean, on that's Street. a boat. Yes, that's isn't a boat. It? That's people getting around in boats. I mean, boats like <laughs> were here on the Rogue River when I was a kid. This is a Knutson boat, and, and they're just about the same. Yes. And that's how you'd get around Sacramento, but other cities besides that. Marysville? Oh, Marysville was flooded, yes. How were. about the Rogue Valley? 
uh, Rogue Valley. Well, that was the big one in the Rogue Valley, uh, 175,000 cubic feet per second at Grants Pass. That is the biggest, uh, that's the biggest number we know of. What about Douglas County? Or do we know how broad this storm was? Up in the Willamette Valley, according to George Taylor, it's the flood of record. And you're talking Southern California, the and flood so of record? All up and down the West Coast. Heaviest in December here, heaviest in Sacramento about January 10th or 11th, and the heaviest of all in Southern California on January 22nd, that last one. You know, you give me some pause to think about <laughs> if one of those dams had let go, yeah. then, I mean, we now hear about you know, the little boy putting his finger in the dike, but yeah. you can't do it with a dam. No, they need, to, they need to work on that. They know that. It heads the list, as I said, of, uh, of government dams to be looked at and, and worked on. You've put this material in a book form. This, yes. not one book, but two books, and you have had a co-author with this. Yes, I have Dr. Claude Curran, uh, Professor Emeritus at Southern Oregon State. I had to bring him in. It was just too big a project for me. He's been, if it hadn't have been for him, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Well, you've brought to Better Life TV a class, that college level class, and I want to thank you. Uh, this is incredible. Well, we I need wanna, to understand. I want to thank you, Bernie, and Better Life Television for giving me this opportunity because this whole 1861 uh, 62, there's not very much known about it. No. There wasn't any video camera going when, was there? <laughs> and we thank Better Life TV. And, and definitely we thank you for being the guest on Journeys and Journals. The journey we've gone today has been a wet one. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Bernie Martin Beck. Say, stay tuned. Better Life has lots of good news, too.